Doom 2016 is one of my favourite games for a multitude of reasons. First and foremost, though, is that it's tremendously good fun to play, with a wonderfully crafted power trip of a difficulty curve. Doom Eternal is, by all means, Doom 2016, but sort of greased, I suppose. It, it moves faster, it hits harder, it kills quicker, and it's got a lovely singing voice to boot, so the question, is Doom Eternal good, would, on paper, be a very easy question to answer. Tragically, with the advent of the technological age, paper is no longer my medium of choice, and, on the rare occasion it is, it's mostly just to send cryptic messages written in the blood of my latest victims to police detectives, so it's not quite that cut and dry anymore. Here we are again, back in Doom, only a Apparently, there was a Doom 2018 that I didn't know about released in the last few years or so. If I remember correctly, the Doom Slayer was put in stasis by Samuel Hayden at the end of 2016, and in Eternal not only is Hayden nowhere to be seen after the initial cutscene, but you're also no longer in stasis, and somewhat puzzlingly, you seem to be captaining a magical space fortress orbiting a demonically possessed Earth. Perhaps it's an experiment in allowing the player to come up with their own exciting escape story to save the writers the trouble of having to actually follow up previous plot threads. That's not to say, however, that my initial point does not stand. Doom Eternal is definitely Doom 2016, but bigger, and it was to my great surprise and pleasure that the game basically picks up where Doom 2016 left off, at least gameplay-wise. No long difficulty ramp-ups here, you're dealing with combat on the scale of 2016's closing few levels from the second level onwards, which rather pleasantly blindsided me. No handing you a pea shooter and asking if you'd feel comfortable swatting four or five imps out of the air for the first two levels. Eternal throws you a shotgun and barks rip and tear for the seventh time that exchange, before throwing a Hell Knight, two Arachnotrons, and a small fleet of Kako demons at you as soon as you exit the mercifully short tutorial segment. Well, I say that tutorial is mercifully short, but Eternals opted to go for more of a scattershot tutorializing method and is subsequently more riddled with tutorials than my destitute uncle is with intestinal parasites. Never once does a new type of enemy appear where you're not immediately and perfectly instructed in how to best dispatch them. I've been playing the Spyro Reignited trilogy recently because the 90s are a siren call to me, which is a game that has about as much place in a review of Doom Eternal as, say, Animal Crossing New Horizon. Oh, ha ah! And it's telling that they've gone a bit overboard with tutorials when Spyro 1 and Doom Eternal both present every new challenge with a little asterisk describing exactly how to overcome them. Press X at the top of your jump to glide, shoot the Doom Hunter with your plasma cannon until its shield is down, and then blow up the sled. How thrilling this gameplay encounter will be now that you've forced me to read the game fact for it ahead of time. In some cases, your magically whisked away by the tutorial fairy to a clandestine clinical testing ground where you can practice the action being asked of you like you're a nervous primary schooler running through chopsticks for the 47th time that day. So that's an annoyance, certainly, but the proof of Doom Eternal's particular blood-soaked brand of pudding is in the ripping and tearing, and Eternal is, by all stretches of the imagination, an absolutely terrific amount of fun. Almost every fight transpires with the velocity of the best of 2016's arena shootouts, and despite the increased complexity provided by the addition of the flame belt, which I used very frequently, and the ice grenades, which I largely forgot existed for grand swaths of my initial playthrough, in addition to the Doom Slayer's newfound appreciation for gymnastics, the game's complexity rarely overwhelmed me, and rather frequently made me feel like an invincible god-king of hyperdeath instead of the pasty, reclusive hermit I actually am. Buff totems, however, were and are a wretched idea. They turn every encounter therein into a desperate easter egg hunt, and only serve to turn what should be an exciting combat challenge into a frustrating game of hide-and-seek, made even less bearable by the fact that every enemy becomes stronger and faster whilst it's still active. You know how in Doom 2, if you no-clip inside the Icon of Sin, you can see John Romero's severed head on a spike? In a hypothetical Doom Everlasting, or whatever they deign to call the next one of these, can the buff totems be replaced by the head of whoever thought buff totems were a good idea so I can at least have the satisfaction of crushing the bastard responsible? The new dash is a brilliant addition as well, allowing two rapid bursts of lateral movement, but to compensate for this, it feels as though your on-foot movement speed has been reduced considerably. I don't know if it's the fault of that reduced speed of the level design or of my own general incompetence, but I found myself not 
uncommonly getting stuck on a piece of oddly placed architecture jutting out from one of the walls and being unable to backpedal away from the horde that was descending upon me and with how fast your health depletes on ultraviolence, if I ever lost a life, which is another new system that I suspect id introduced to serve as a crutch more than anything else, that's where it usually happened. There are a few enemies that are very enjoyable to fight and that almost carry Doom Eternal into first person Devil May Cry territory at times. The Marauder, for example, kicked my ass to the wall and back when I first encountered him, but he quickly became my favourite enemy to fight in every instance where he couldn't swiftly be fought one on one. Tragically, he's very rarely fought one on one in something I've taken to call the Sekiro conundrum. If an enemy is made to be fought one on one, cluttering the arena with smaller enemies that pepper you with spitballs and run in for a casual swipe of the claws with a complete and reckless disregard for social distancing only serves to frustrate. And yes, you can very successfully argue that the smaller enemies are there is fodder to restore your health, but attempting to capitalize on that when your adoring fan is insisting that you remain within three feet of him at all times is like trying to take a sip from a particularly rancorous drinking fountain whilst the local bastard repeatedly whacks the small of your back with a 2 by 4 A few of the new changes to the systems did confound me at first in 2016, since your ammo pools were so excessively large after a few upgrades the chainsaw was relegated to being a I don't feel like fighting this baron of hell right now button instead of the ammo fountain it was intended to be. Since ammo totals are drastically lower in Eternal, the total shotgun ammo you can carry is down from 2016 60 to 24, for example, the chainsaw sees its intended use as a convenient restocking button fully realized, but that means fuel is much better spent chopping up meek little zombies since they take less fuel to dispatch. We do get the crucible instead as a dedicated I don't feel like fighting this arch vile right now button, but it comes too little too late to be considered a core part of the combat rotation, and there's something demonstrably less satisfying about cleanly slicing through demons with a superheated energy sword than there is eviscerating them with a heavy duty gardening implement. But by and large, the gameplay is strictly better here than it was in Doom 2016. If the gameplay were the only part of Doom Eternal that mattered, that would almost certainly mean that I wholeheartedly endorse Eternal as one of the finest first person shooters I've ever had the pleasure to play, but sadly, there's a big caveat to that enjoyment, and to see why, we need to look at the one line that had me almost literally writhing in my godforsaken chair. I believe him now to be more than just a man. He is Doom. This line is emblematic of everything wrong with the writing in Doom Eternal, and from this point on, we're going to get into why, but I'd like to put an asterisk next to everything I'm about to say with a, but it's a fantastic game to play. The fuck was that? When I first saw reviews of Doom Eternal Surface, I was surprised to see a lot of critics complain that the writing was very bad, which inspired in me the exact same reaction I had to Far Cry 5 reviews at the time of that game's launch. The story is not what I'm there for, I play these games for the gameplay was the predominant thought in my mind, but it's telling that at time of writing I both absolutely abhor and have never finished Far Cry 5 because of its mesmerizingly, actively, harmfully bad writing. The same, fortunately, is not true of Eternal, otherwise this would be a fairly short review, but that's not to say it passes unmaligned. The writing in this game is amongst the worst I've seen. Now, a lot of you might say that lore doesn't matter in Doom because it's a game about shooting demons in the face very fast and hard, and personally, I agree with you completely. It would be really nice if someone could quickly give the writers at id a ring to let them know, though, because it seems like they didn't quite get the memo. Every level is scattered with codex entries, and Christ, the codex entries, all seven million of them. Doom Eternal begs you to read its codex with an earnest, naive enthusiasm not dissimilar to an overeager Latter-day Saint desperately asking you to please just give them five minutes of your time. This is even more short-sighted given the fact that the Doom Slayer's total fixation on killing demons for the sake of killing demons is his entire character and it's all his character ever needed to be. I never once got the sense in 2016 that the Doom Slayer was actually out there to say 
save the human race, ball of rage and violence incarnate that he was, so to have bent over backwards to explain the origins of this character who's far more enjoyable when he's just anger manifested as a built white dude wearing a garbage can is about as far in the opposite direction of where I wanted this series to go as possible. They filled in the backstory for a character that was never supposed to have one fundamentally, an act about as well thought out as taking your diabetic friend on a trip to Willy Wonka's chocolate factory. They've opted to go for a maximalist nightmare whilst also going back to the old, and this is something I very intensely hesitate to say, lore, and balancing the Khan Makers and the Night Sentinels of Argent de Nure with the Doom Guy's pet rabbit is about as bizarre an attempt at plate spinning as I can fathom. It's only palatable if you're not taking it very seriously, yet the writers for Eternal are clearly doing exactly that, unless the sheer volume and intensity of the writing is the joke. And if the volume of serious backstory in a goofy game like Doom Eternal is the joke, then I'm not going to read the serious backstory, because it's a joke. On the other hand, if it's meant to be serious than having it juxtaposed with laser guitars and renaissance paintings of the Doom Slayer holding Daisy is like getting Mickey Mouse to voice a documentary called Whoopee Cushions the Holocaust and You. Really the whole game has a more cartoonish bent now. Caco demons have big scared pupils in their eyes now and they comically pop when they're killed, not to mention the comical method of dispatch that involves shooting a grenade into their mouth. The Hell Knights have eyes now too, so they can look at you in fear when you go in for a kiss. There's that giant magical spell space fortress I mentioned earlier, that bloody unicorn skin for Twitch Prime members, that execrable hipster arch vial, those Super Mario Brothers style floating fire chains that spin around a point, this godforsaken tone. They all speak to Doom's new wacky ironic comical bent that I really just, just fucking loathe. At times the writing feels almost Borderlandsian, like the writers at id took a page out of Anthony Burke's least funny ironic gaming jokes notepad. If you're unfamiliar with my feelings on the writing within the Borderlands series, by the by, allow me to briefly get you up to speed for clarity's sake. I'm a little teapot, bloody and I was gonna call a piss for brains you know in honor of you. Phone phone I'm having a fucking heart attack! As a friend once said, there's a very fine line between making the player feel powerful and jerking the player off, and it seems like the line's been crossed and then retrodden so many times as to be completely pointless. The Kadinga tablets in Doom 2016 made you out to be this archangel of death, yes, but they were so esoteric and biblical that their relation to what you were actually doing made them feel mostly like a very cool, mysterious backdrop that made you think, shit, is that who I'm really? playing as? The Doom Eternal equivalent of those are the voice recordings from some generic scientist on Earth metaphorically filleting Doom Guy for the entire level, and I really do feel the need to emphasize that metaphorically, if only to prove that I didn't accidentally run H Doom instead. As far as I'm concerned, this and the actual voiced rip and tear from our previously silent protagonist are the nadir of what writing in this series could and should be, and it's for that reason that I feel conflicted about whether or not I prefer Eternal or Doom. Doom 2016, and this is highlighted in the UAC spokesperson. The UAC spokesperson in Doom 2016 was arguably the funniest part of that game. She was basically a GLaDOS type character, a pre-recorded sadistic influence that seemed relatively benign, but beneath that layer of obviously false benevolence was a wealth of black comedy. In Eternal, the UAC spokesperson hologram just spouts overtly evil nonsense. Remember, the blind council is always watching is funny. Don't be afraid, once your soul has been consumed your fear will cease to exist is not. There's on the nose and then there's blunt force trauma. I've tactfully avoided any discussion of the bizarre, inflammatory, right-wing, leaning, anti-SJW messaging in the game that stops just shy of having the Doom Slayer break into the office of the UAC spokesperson and saying, is this your safe space before throwing her out of a window, but the constant use of the term mortally challenged did certainly rub me the wrong way. I'm all for making fun of people, god knows my friends who are furries know that all too well, but metaphorically conflating immigrants with an actual demonic horde from the very bowels of hell itself 
is a step too far in my opinion. I don't know where they were going with this, or perhaps I just don't want to believe it, but it did seem, putting it generously, unnecessary. Certainly a great deal of people are made fun of here, and the idea of solving all of your problems with unflinching violence rather succinctly embodies the Doom Slayer, but if the developers are suggesting that's something we should be aspiring to, that's unconscionable. I hope the greedy pillocks were just using it to court controversy to drive cells upwards, but even then, that's the kind of shit I'd expect from EA circa 2007, not id in 2020. I've heard people suggest that it's there to show that evil corporations can use progressive rhetoric to try and appear more friendly and progressive themselves, but that doesn't explain why the anti-demon resistance group also refers to the demons as the mortally challenged. It's a mess. Bizarre messaging aside, I did have a brilliant time playing Doom Eternal when I was clicking the button on the mouse that made the gun shooty shooty bang bang and the demon go splat, and since this is a Doom game, I'm tempted to say it's better than 2016 just on that merit alone. It's certainly the single biggest merit I can give to a game that its gameplay is superlative, but it's couched in such unpleasant or otherwise insultingly stupid writing that's more divorced from subtlety than Henry VIII was from his various wives that I just wish the game would shut the fuck up and leave me to my murders in peace. In the words of my questionably heterosexual father's favourite Ronan Keating song, Doom says it best when it says nothing at all. Ultimately better armchair critics than I have made the most apt comparison in my mind before I have. Doom Eternal is very much a warts and all type follow-up, except the warts have, in some cases, become malignant tumours. It's a Portal 2 type of sequel, a sequel that does away with the refined simplicity of its forebear and instead elects to simply make everything bigger regardless of context, the Texas of video game sequels. What we're seeing here is a team of developers having successfully reinvigorated a franchise everyone else had mostly moved on from, becoming aware of what people liked about the previous game in the series, and doubling down on every aspect of it, and whilst this has resulted in the story becoming, to put it generously, an incredibly overwrought mistake, it's also paid absolute dividends on the gameplay front. Just capturing footage for this review after playing the game for the first time in a week or so, I felt the same kind of adrenaline rush that had me fall in love with 2016 in the first place. It is still a phenomenal gameplay experience, one of the finest out there for my money, but my complete and total exasperation with the writing had me desperately wanting to skip every cutscene I had to reluctantly allow to play unmaligned for the sake of the footage for this very review. Does that mean that Doom Eternal is still worth buying? Law of Averages, the writing is far, far less important than the gameplay, so I do recommend Eternal very highly, I just do encourage that you remember that you hold R to skip.